I'm Mary Davidson, and it's our community. In our community today is Charles Nydick. He's a clarinetist. He is one-fourth of the Brentano String Quartet. And the New Yorker said of him, he is a master of his instrument and beyond a clarinetist. Mm -hmm. Now, them is mighty fine words. Oh. <laughs> and I think well-deserved. You have performed all over the world. But I have to ask you, having performed all over the world, do you find the audiences different? Well, <clears throat> that's in, in a certain way a complicated question because in, in different places there are different traditions of reacting, let's say. Uh -huh. But I find that if, if the performance is compelling, if then always the audience has a kind of warmth which uh, I love and which you can compare from China to uh, Germany to Kansas City to here so, and so that uh, in a certain way uh, audiences are very much the same if the performance is uh, you know emotional enough so. And you can feel it. That's right. Yeah. I, in it, other it, words, people are people who love music. Oh, but that's always the case. Yeah. That's right. That's and true. music is, in in many ways, a universal language. That somehow, the, the, with, without the words, it it expresses something that everybody can identify with. But that must be a wonderful feeling to sit there and to show people your talent, to give of yourself, and to have them give back to you a warmth that um, you probably don't feel any other time except when you're playing. I think that's true. And it's because of the music. Mm -hmm. You see, if you, if, uh, I think that if, you, if you're trying to show yourself or, or you know, somehow to you know, show off, yeah. that, like, that, oh, I'm great or whatever, then it doesn't come across. But if you very sincerely communicate the emotion of the music, then the audience responds, and uh, you can have a very special kind of interaction. I know that your mother was a pianist. That's right. And your father a clarinetist. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, you play both. That's right. Did you ever, what, what made you decide to choose the clarinet? Hmm, well... <laughs> your father was stronger than your mother. <laughs> well, not stronger, actually. My, my mother was too strict, perhaps. <laughs> you know, so... So you rebelled. So I rebelled, that's right. And my, my father was very patient. And that's why I end up playing the clarinet today as a profession. And I would say that the piano is my hobby. Are you... I know this is an odd question. Are you as proficient at the piano as you are at the clarinet? Uh, I would say no. Uh, I'm uh, pretty proficient at the piano, but because I'm, I'm not a uh, professional performer at yeah. the piano, I don't practice as much. As much, yes. You I see. And you, in order to, to play an instrument, it, it's like sports in the sense that you have to train, you have to practice, and it's, it's more than sports because it, you, you're always practicing, you know, even if, if you are, uh, you know, someone, let's say, the pianist Arthur Rubinstein who played into his 90s, he was practicing a lot when he was more than 90 years old. In other words, you can play as long as your fingers work and you can stand up. <laughs> exactly. That's right. If you practice. If you practice. But you have, you're always, always working at it. And uh, if you don't, you feel it. At what, what point, what years do you think are your prime years now? Uh, that's also very interesting because I think music is, is, in, is different from sports in that you can you always in a certain way get better because mm -hmm. the the experience of uh, understanding the music is what is most important That's really so, yeah so it's, it's communicating something more than just the performance 
the nuances. It's the it's the nuance. It's some, somehow communicating the meaning of the music, mm -hmm. which you can't express outside of the music. Okay. You see, but this g gets better and better as you gain experience and uh, experience in life also. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Now you cheated a little bit because you have a BA in anthropology. That's true. And why did you do that? Well. Um, Again, I can go back to my parents. They, they were musicians, mm -hmm. and they knew that being a musician is not so easy. Um, in fact, I would say that t to be a musician is not something that you choose, like to be um, uh, an accountant or some or a profession, which which you you can be very interested in. Either, but mm -hmm. to be a musician is is kind of a calling that you have. Are you saying that if you have within you some talent, it chooses you? Yes, I think that's true. So my parents, they realize that uh, being a musician is difficult. It's, it's a lot of work and uh, the remuneration for the amount of work that you do is, is not nearly what you get in many other professions. Uh, they thought that I should have an education. A plan B. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or even I would just say the, that also that music is something that that if it chooses you, it ends up consuming you. Right. So you're always thinking about music. So it'd be nice, they thought, to get an education so that you you can actually have an experience of something outside of music that you know something of the world, you know something of of. Uh, not only literature, but of, you know cultures and and uh, also even things like mathematics and you know they must be very interesting stuff. people. Uh, well, I think so. Yeah, yeah. they they yeah. you know I I. Yeah. But this is not not tremendously unusual for uh, children of musicians because they know how hard it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And so, they, in a certain way, they kept sort of pushing me, pushing me to, to uh, somewhere, and I would always bounce back to music. So they pushed me. It never occurred back. to you not to not to be a musician. That's right. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. But I do know this: that upon graduation from Yale, you received uh, was it the first Fulbright scholarship? Yeah. Yes. To the then Soviet Union. That's right. So you spent three years. That's right. In Moscow. That's right. You took lessons. Yeah. Is their style of teaching different, the same? H how did you find... Um, yes, it was different. Moscow. It was different mm -hmm. uh, in a very interesting way mm -hmm. because uh, for wind players, such as clarinetists mm -hmm. or flutists, oboists... The breathers. The, sooners, the breathers, that's right. <laughs> um, in, in the United States especially, what is emphasized is reading music is what is called sight reading mm -hmm. a lot, so that you can play a lot of different repertoire very quickly. So that uh, so they hand you the music and you can play. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can and you can sort of look at it and immediately see what it is. Mm -hmm. But what is not so emphasized, or, or was not so emphasized when I was studying, and um, it's something that my father didn't uh, uh, make me do. For instance, is to to actually to memorize music. So he was a sight believed in sight reading too. That's right. Yes, but he was solidly in in this United States uh, um, wind school, mm -hmm. we could say. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Moscow, everybody, you see, it, I, I should make a little detour that uh, pianists, especially, and also uh, violinists, and mm -hmm. to some extent cellists. Uh, will start out memorizing music from when they're very little. And of course, it, you, pianists do that because there's so many notes to play, is that it's, it's very hard to look at the music and look at your hands, look at this, you see. <laughs> so you really have to... Your eyeballs don't case. move that fast. That's right, yeah. So, <laughs> so you're all, all, pianists are always memorizing. And, you, you know, there's so much you can't turn the page and play. It takes, you know, that, that's... Uh, all of that is kind of uh, cumbersome, you could say, so that they, they will memorize. Um, but in, in Moscow, mm -hmm. the training was that everybody memorized uh, from, from the beginning. 
so when I went there, that was the first thing I had to do. I had to come into a lesson, and whether it was an etude or a scale or anything, or, or a piece of music, or not, it had to be played from memory. That was difficult for you? Uh, well, I, mean, I still wasn't so old, so it, it was not, <laughs> not so difficult, but it was unusual. Yeah. You know, and I had to get used to it at first, but it was very good. It's, it's very good training. Very good training. Yeah, because you end up working on pieces in a much more detailed way. When you concertize now, yes. do you memorize now or do oh, you yes. side read? I will, I will always memorize everything, regardless of whether I use the music or play for memory. Because um, it's just that you learn the piece very much better. If you're just lo looking at the music, then the, the hard part, you, you probably memorize. And, and mm -hmm. even when I wasn't memorizing when I was little, something that was a little bit difficult, I you would did. end up memorizing because you have to, I would have to practice it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you practice it several times to get it and you memorize it. But then there's whole other sections which are, are perhaps not so difficult. But if you're actually playing in concert, those are the sections probably where you end up making the mistake because you haven't practiced them enough. What do you think, let's take yourself, Yeah. what do you think are the qualities that make you a beyond a clarinetist? Oh, to gosh. quote the, the New Yorker, what qualities mm -hmm. do you have? Both, per, I'm not so much, well technique could be one, clarinet technique, but within you what qualities does yeah. it take? Well, that's a uh, difficult question for me to answer myself. Mm -hmm. I think I'm not. I'm not uh, used to boasting in a certain way oh, that I'm this, I'm that. But uh, I think it is. It, it, it is a, a very compelling sense of expression in music, and uh, I mean, people say that I have unusual technique, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and uh, that's probably true, uh, that there are certain things I can do on the instrument that uh, very few people... But you started are, very uh, young. Yes, that's that right. And those fingers have that's been right. moving a very long time. But that's true. A long time. Not that's a very true. long time, a long time. That's true, yeah. 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 Actually, this is interesting, because uh, n now you, you have people starting earlier, and I think that uh, I see, in a way, my own influence in in the so, sort of very young generation. You know, that that I, I see people who are kids who are like 13, 14, 15 years old who have been already playing for a while, and they can not play things which were unheard of to, uh, just not so long ago. Mm -hmm. In fact, because the uh, that basic training is, has gotten better. And I think partly, uh, as I say, my influence was I showed that certain things could be done on the instrument, then other people start being able to do it. And then I, I begin to teach them also, and then other people teach them too. And then they're able to be taught to younger people. And then uh, when, I, when I started playing, of course, it was very unusual for a wind player to begin as young as I did. Uh, but n then, after you know years, people think, well, why not? It's possible. Doesn't hurt. Exactly right. <laughs> That's right. I think though that there are a couple of other things. One is focus. Yes. And the other is commitment. You never deviate That's from right. that point beyond which is excellence. I think that's true. I think I think that's very true. You need you need to have a. a imagination of what is very good, very compelling, and then you have to demand it of yourself so that uh, you don't say, ah, well today I'm not going to play so well or something like or that. Or I won't practice today. Or I won't practice. That's right. Can't and do so, that. No, no, impossible. I think there's another thing. You must have a wonderful set of lungs. That uh, breath is well, I do. a good breather. That's right. I, I mean, there's also a technique I use, which is called circular breathing, so that I can play and, and, and breathe at the same time. I noticed that when I watched you play, occasionally your cheeks the, will puff. Right. And th that is the circular breathing part. Where does the air come in? Through your nose? Uh, yeah. 
You see, you, you, you just take air in your cheeks and you can, you can have about two seconds of air which you squeeze out mm -hmm. and that's plenty of time to take a breath. It's actually a very ancient technique. Really? Yeah. In for, Eastern, for musicians or, or? Well, for musicians. Or other? Well, also, uh, well, for instance, glass blowers. Ah. That's from, from the very early times. They had to circular breathe. Because just think of it, if you are blowing a, a kind of vase or something, mm -hmm. if you run out of air, you have to start over. <laughs> You're in terrible shape. Exactly. <laughs> you see, so they developed this technique. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at the time of Bach, the flutist who he know with, for whom he wrote his uh, flute sonatas, his name was Pierre Gabriel Buffardin. Mm -hmm. actually wrote about circular breathing. Really? Yeah, that he could do it and that he learned from glass blowers in, at that time, Constantinople. Isn't that fascinating? I know it is, yeah. It, who taught you? Well, a friend of my father who was an oboist and taught me at the right time. I was 15 years old mm -hmm. and that's a great time to, to learn things like that. Um, because if it's later and you can already play very well, the problem is you learn something new like circular breathing and all of a sudden you sound bad. Because you can't have that. Of course not, yeah. But <laughs> if you're, you know, just a young teenager, it's just exciting. It's interesting. You know, it is, so that's, that's, that's the, the time. Absolutely and, fascinating. And actually, Again, I talk about about this sort of latest generation of, of clarinet players coming up, and uh, now many actually circular breathe. That's a, sort of taken from me, but they are beginning now when they're around 14, 15. In many ways, um, you have been a trailblazer oh, that's in, true. in the performance of the clarinet. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. I do think that. Yeah. When you play, what are you thinking about? What goes through your mind? I think about the music. In other words, you don't see the audience, you don't... Uh, basically, no. Because that anything that's a distraction can sort of make you make a mistake, <laughs> or sort of screw up, or, 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 Can't have or that not either. play as, as well as you can. Papers pick that up. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's... it's uh, I mean, I'm sure that people are different. But I, th I believe when I play that it's very important to be at the moment that you're playing. Then let's pull out another thread. Yeah. Concentration. Yeah. Yes. So you, you concentrate on the moment. But so when I'm playing, I'm, 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 I'm playing here, but I'm also in my mind singing the music as it's going on. And I would venture to say that you are oblivious to what's going on around you. For the Almost. Most part. Yeah. Well, you have th three other people sitting there. Yeah, but, but it's, it's almost oblivious, but it's uh, also with the audience. I mean, you know, sometimes you, you see some, some, something happening mm -hmm. or somebody. Yeah. But uh, I, I, uh, if, if that happens, I try to, to, Go back. to focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're playing chamber music like we will tonight mm -hmm. with the quartet, so what, w w this, there's a communal activity going on which is 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 quite wonderful and so that I'm uh, I'm saying I'm focusing on the music but then the music is not only my own part but it's theirs as well. it's theirs as well and and you see it goes around the group in a way the so, team yeah it is. yeah, yeah. In, in a, so that and you're you you at for one at one point you have the primary voice and then you go back to support somebody else who does. You don't always have to be the star. That's right. I think yeah, that's it's it's the well. In any case, I think finally it's the music that's the star. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And you yeah. have been um, noted as being a restorer of Mozart concertos. Yeah. How do you do that? How, what what does that entail to restore? Oh well, the, this is this is something very. Uh, uh, specific. I, I've, I've restored uh, original versions of various pieces, mm -hmm. uh, not only Mozart, 
but also from uh, the the concerto of Alan, Aaron Copland, for instance, I've restored his original version. Define restore. Okay. Well, I, I, I will. I will. In in with for Mozart, let's uh -huh. say, mm -hmm. uh, he wrote it for his friend, mm -hmm. whose name was Anton Stadler. Mm -hmm. Stadler was one of the great musicians, uh, the greatest clarinetist of his day, mm -hmm. and he was not only a clarinetist, but he was in a, in a certain way an inventor. Mm -hmm. He worked uh, with the maker to create an, an instrument which played lower. Oh. Actually. Was it larger? It was, it was longer. Longer. And yeah. Heavy, uh, thicker? Better? Uh, mm, well, it, it had a bell, which was a, a bigger. very, yes, mm -hmm. bigger, sort of an mm -hmm. odd shape mm -hmm. bell. Uh, we know now what his instrument looked like. For years, we didn't know what it looked like. Mm -hmm. But in Riga, just a few years ago, a, a program was found from a concert which he gave, which had a, a drawing of his instrument. Does restoration entail um, reworking the music? Yes, yes, yes. I'll explain more. You see, but now, this concerto, though, from Mozart, was only published 10 years after Mozart's death. Uh -huh. And we don't, we don't have an original manuscript mm -hmm. of the piece, and we don't even have any kind of source which was used for that first publication. Everything has been lost. And the piece, as I said, had been written for this instrument which went lower. Which you don't have. Which we don't have, mm -hmm. you would know, say. And in 1801, when the piece was uh, uh, published, mm -hmm. it was published in a version for regular clarinet. You see. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I did was I restored what I feel is probably the way Mozart wrote for the larger instrument. And in, in a way, it's not so difficult, because w what you find in the standard version is, uh, let's, let's, let's say if we look at music that says, here's one register, here's another mm -hmm, register. Mm -hmm. See this low register, which is too low for the regular clarinet, we look and we, we see a lot of things taken up an octave. Uh -huh. You see, so that register's up here, Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, in the orchestra, there's no bass line. And they're, then, they're left with nothing. You, well, then you take that part, put it down, mm -hmm. and then you see it fits where the bass would have been. Ah, so you rejigger it so it meshes. Exactly. Ah. You see? And then it becomes very uh, wonderful because mm -hmm. you get a piece which has... Um, like three characters. Mm -hmm. So you have the bass or baritone down there, then you have the kind of tenor voice, mm -hmm. and then the soprano. An opera. Exactly. <laughs> that's I think right. that's wonderful. Now yeah. you're also very interested in current composers right. and current music. Do you find a huge difference in the, the composers today? I realize that, you know, today is a different age and a different yes. time. Um, but what, what, what could you say about the composers today that you find really talented? Uh, well, I would say, first of all, that music deals with expression. Exactly. You see. And even if, even if you have a, a modern piece, let's say, which is very complex, mm -hmm. if I find that it has... This, this kind of a expression, dramatic gesture, uh -huh. things like that, then I think that it's, it, it can be just as compelling as, as earlier music. Could we say then that music, just like everything else, is a product of the time in which it is written, oh, played, Oh, of course. That's heard. absolutely right. And, mm -hmm. and you, you see that throughout mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the case. Uh, and I actually think that it's a responsibility of musicians to play music that's written now and not simply only music that's written in the past, although we can also, we have the, the privilege of playing music which was written in the past all, as well. 
musicians have a smorgasbord from That's which right. to choose. That's and right. I think that part of the talent that you have is the responsibility to give to your listeners the best that that you know and the variety of good music that that's available. That's right. That's okay. right. From all ages. Yeah. Exactly right. I also know that you are extremely interested in conducting. Yes. What what brought you to that? Um I think the the reason to be a conductor is if you have special conception of pieces, uh -huh. large pieces of music, uh -huh. you see, and so that you, so I, I'm, I, I, I became more and more interested in conducting. When I heard performances, I thought, hmm, that's not so interesting. Are you thinking about a midlife career change? Uh, well, you see, with music, it's, it's not really career change. It's it's just it's continuation. A move. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, it's just a continuation, yeah, yeah. I would say. Uh, but the the important thing is that if you you feel that you you have a sense of a piece of music, but you're growing that, all the time. That's right. And I think artists do that. That's right. They, I, I, I. That's I, right. That's part of who you are. That's right. Yeah. In the few uh, seconds we have left. I would be remiss if I did not ask you to talk just a little bit about Antoni Brentano. Uh huh. Because it is for her that the Brentano Quartet is named. Yes, yeah. Uh, and she was? Well, she was sort of the, the hidden beloved, uh, that's, or the, that, that we think. Was that's a it's for for Beethoven, but uh, w nobody knows for sure whether uh, she was really that that was really the beloved or not. She was, yeah. But you chose but, her. Uh, well, I I was not the one who chose. It's actually the the principal violinist was the one, and and. Uh, I think that it's it's uh, it, it comes from the idea of basically love of music. But yeah, isn't that what you do? Yes. You you transmit your love of music to all the people that's who right. love music and cannot do what that's you right. do. And I I am so pleased and and uh, so appreciative that yeah. you have taken your time to talk to us today. Um, in our community, um, Charles Nydick. You are a teacher, a clarinetist of the first magnitude, <laughs> a conductor, and you have given us the greatest gift of all, and that is food for our soul. Oh, thank you, you so much. You have made us all smile. But thank you for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm Mary Davidson, right. and it's our community. We're so pleased that you could be with us. <laughs>